there is an important theme which I wanted to share with you, <coughs> for which I could not come up with a suitable title. And what you have is the best that I could give. But I want, what I want to share in that is not exactly what the title conveys. So let's leave aside the title and dwell on the theme itself. One of the great errors of modern science emerges from the ego of science itself. Just as religions have an ego, mine is the only true path, others are all false, so science also has its own ego. What we have discovered is the only truth, anything else is not possible, is not true. Except that science being rational and inherently self-testing tends to correct its errors as it goes along. But the ego is subtle. And one of the great errors that it has been perpetuating for a long time is the idea that life can only be the way we experience it. And therefore, it can only be here on earth. Anything else is not possible or must necessarily be of an inferior order. We have spacecrafts going to Mars and the tests for life that they place there are all of a very basic order looking for bacteria. Even the tests for life are of a secondary order than the tests for minerals. It's as if you start with the assumption there will be no life. The spiritual perspective is very different. If you look at the relationship of matter, life and mind with the spirit, we see something quite different that matter is universal, life energy is universal, mind is universal, and therefore, one would expect that everywhere in the universe there would be this struggle of life emerging out of matter. Everywhere without exception. Because as we see it, matter itself is a condensation of life. And if matter exists, then life is only hiding behind the surface. And life will try to organize itself because that is an inherent impulse. Bacteria, at the very least, should be found in some form almost anywhere. So science always started with the assumption that life could only be in this narrow band of comfort zone that we experience. Bacteria cannot survive at a lower or higher temperature. As we have discovered over time, not only they do survive, they thrive. We were taught that plants or animals or even bacteria could not exist without sunlight. As we discover, they thrive in places where there's no sunlight. Deep down under the ocean, where no light reaches at the bottom, at pressure of hundreds of pounds per square inch, two or three kilometers down in the water, where the water has no oxygen and no sunlight, you find not only bacteria thriving, but all kinds of creatures, fish, worms, blind fish. What do they feed on? They feed on something which feeds on something which feeds on what? From the volcanic chemicals emerging from the seafloor at a temperature that is nearly boiling point. We go under the earth, down a few hundred meters, life doesn't stop. There are bacteria which live without sunlight and oxygen. They feed off the stone. They generate their heat from the material they find in the stone. And we find this going down all the way several kilometers into the earth, where it gets too warm. And we still find bacteria thriving. 
And if those fish or bacteria from the bottom of the ocean were to be brought up, they would die of cold because they need that heat in which they grow. They would die because they can't survive in an environment which doesn't have that kind of pressure. We discover at the bottom of layers of ice kilometers thick lakes in the Antarctic region where you still find life forms across billions of years that it has been frozen. Millions of years at least. And thriving and developing. We find them in caves which are completely sealed. No sunlight, no fresh oxygen going in and still they grow and thrive. Fish growing there are blind generally and so on. So if this could be the case for the earth, why not elsewhere? One of the moons of uh, Jupiter, Europa, is found to have an ocean covered with one thick layer of ice around. Jets of water bursting out, rising several kilometers high from the pressure in the ocean and it's a liquid ocean. Why not that life should be there? Why not that it should have evolved? And Mars, of all places, has everything necessary for life except now as it appears the atmosphere is a little too thin, the water seems to have evaporated or at least it's got frozen in the poles and it's under the ground inside the caves but at least under the ground within the caves there should be life. Sri Aurobindo has a cryptic comment in the record of yoga as I mentioned earlier, there his personal diary notes. He speaks of how life moves across planets as a focal point within a solar system. And he says the previous cycle of life was on Mars. And from there it has moved to the Earth. It's a very suggestive comment. But he doesn't say too much more. But if you look at the nature of life, it's obvious it must be everywhere to different degrees of evolution. If we consider the universe itself is so many billions of years old at least, and that's only one theory. There's another theory much more likely to survive the test of time, which is that the universe never had a birth. It is as eternal as the source, which is closer to the Vedic concept in any case. In which case, there would be out there, there are right now at least some trillions of planets which are Earth-like. And if nothing else, life should have evolved on some of them which are much older than us. And if it has evolved, it might have grown enough that it has learned to travel across space as we are beginning to learn. It's possible that they have come here. It's possible that they have mastered technologies also to travel in other ways, faster than light. Perhaps even by astral means, as we can also go out of body and project ourselves anywhere in the universe, they could do the same and materialize on the other end. Perhaps even de develop technologies of that kind. All of that is in the realm of very real possibility. So why am I speaking of all this? Because it's time that we begin to view ourselves from a different perspective that we are not alone, that there is life elsewhere, there is life everywhere and the life does visit us as we can visit them. The problem though is, in our current cycle of civilization, and we have had many before including the fabled Atlantis and Lemuria and so on, in our current cycle of civilization, we have come to that point where we are on the brink of self-destruction. Nuclear power is one of those means. But what is likely to cause the selfish destruction is not so much the nuclear power, but our short-term thinking and internal differences and hatred among us. And Sri Aurobindo has a whole uh, book on this theme of the ideal of human unity. It's not the topic of my discussion. But he shows there how we are at one of those most critical junctures. If we can make it through this, then we will survive. If we do not, we will very quickly destroy ourselves. The science has gone further than our consciousness. 
the evolution of our consciousness needs to now cross over this current divisive intellectual consciousness, egocentricity, to a higher grade of a uniting consciousness. But when that happens, here on earth, we can also say it has happened elsewhere before and will continue to happen in other planets later. And if there are other evolved civilizations which can travel across planets, which are perhaps even inhabiting planets within our solar system, they would be watching with great interest what is happening on earth. They may even want to intervene if a situation so demands. And we have some very interesting information of these things, information, interesting records. The most interesting of these we find in the early 40s, in the middle of the Second World War, many of the fighter pilots who were on bombing missions used to see glowing lights following them and sometimes coming very close to their planes, sometimes their engines would shut down because of the proximity with those lights and then those lights would go away. And they didn't know what to call it. This term emerged Foo Fighters. Some of you may have read of it. And subsequently we see a series of sightings which later get named as flying saucers because they were disc-shaped craft often. And generally later unidentified flying objects. We don't know what they are, but they're there. What has happened subsequently is, over time, some of these have been quite blatant in their appearances. There is a very famous incident where almost, I think, 150 of these flying disks were seen flying over Washington, D.C. They were photographed, they were tracked on radar, they sped away faster than planes could follow them. When uh, astronauts went out into space, the first time they had these disks watching them, following them. The first trips to the moon had disks following them and so on. Which all suggest that there are intelligences watching over the earth. They may not be of earthly origin or they might be, they might be from subtle planes, they might be from other planets. We really don't know too much. But still they are watching. From a purely spiritual perspective, we will say there are many divine beings whose job it is to ensure that the earth evolution is protected and guided along safe lines. But why not that there are also material beings who have similar objectives? And we find some very interesting incidents which are now part of the declassified documents, which one of them, for example, on one of the Air Force bases here in the US, where they had nuclear missiles pointed to Russia and other places, a UFO appeared, hovered over the base, and all the power systems shut down in the base. So they didn't know what to do, they didn't know if it was an attack from a Russian uh, secret craft or whatever. And then they found, when the main power shuts down, all the missiles have their own internal battery backup those began to fail and all the missiles shut down and the UFO left. The power came back but the missiles remained shut. They went to study what happened and they found the computer chips for guidance of the missile had been fused, they had been melted. And at the same time that this happened in the US, the same thing happened in Russia, the U then USSR. A craft appeared, dis disabled all their missiles. Now these are part of declassified documents, people who have been witness to this have come out in public and so on. But in the public domain it is a scary thought, for the military it's a scary thought. There is a power out there that's more powerful than our military which can affect all of our craft and so on. There have even been attempts where beings from these crafts have landed, met with people, interacted with them, given messages saying that your experiments with nuclear power are extremely destructive, it's going to unbalance the Earth's ecosystem, you have to stop over the air explosions. I'll give an example here of one case which, is, which took place in Brazil in 1952 and 53, where the being from the craft, human looking, completely human being, came and met with this person, they had long conversations which were documented and published in 1956. 
And interestingly, they include not only descriptions of the uh, damaging results of nuclear radiation and uh, over-the-ground open-air nuclear tests, but also the fact that as a result, there will be certain changes in life forms, new kinds of diseases will appear, the ozone hole forming, the melting of the ice caps, and, a, and a, as a result, a disbalancing of the Earth's balance. It's a spinning top after all. If the ice melts in millions of tons very rapidly, it can disbalance something which is spinning so fast. And all of these descriptions are documented in a book published in 1956. I'm not one, there are many, many such cases. All of which have been validated later by science. In fact, the earliest references to the ozone hole forming are found in this one text and in another which was a letter sent out by somebody in Switzerland. You may have heard of somebody called Billy Meyer who had a series of contacts with people from flying saucers. He was asked to send out these letters to various uh, heads of scientific study groups, heads of government in, in the 1970s. As a result, scientists began to verify whether this is true and they discovered their satellites were set, they were programmed to ignore any data which went beyond a certain level. And the ozone hole was already crossing that level, that threshold. So they had to recalibrate their satellites and they discovered, yes, there was an ozone hole already. And there is, this took place because of these letters. There are very interesting things like this. Mother herself has a reference to having seen a flying saucer and she said, I'd like to meet one of those space beings. She leaves it at that. Then she makes a general comment. She says, oh, there's an interesting letter of Sri Aurobindo where he says something like, uh, we're too busy in this incarnation, we're too busy with the earth to worry about other planets. And the mother makes a comment that uh, this earth is like a special focal point in the universe where all the possibilities of the universe have been gathered together to be worked out here. And in particular, the special feature of the psychic being is on Earth. Now it does not mean that it's not there in other places, but here it is highlighted, it is emphasized. And so we see already a perspective where they are seeing a larger picture of evolution, but then their focus is on Earth and there's something special happening here which is not so special elsewhere. Doesn't mean it's not happening elsewhere, but it's not as special elsewhere. And it is towards this that I want to bring our attention. We are at a time of transition where not only we have to come together as a human species, but we have to recognize that we are part of a larger life network across the universe. And it's not enough to speak about peace on Earth if all of Earth is now to militarize itself against other planets, we have really not solved the problem. It's time to view peace in terms of a larger universality, universal peace. And how does that change our perspective? of our evolution and especially our spiritual evolution. It only changes the viewpoint. So far we had a very narrow viewpoint. Oh, Earth and human evolution, spiritual evolution. But when we widen our perspective, we see a much larger field. And beings perhaps who are more evolved than us, and beings who are less evolved, but it does not change the nature of the process itself. Because everywhere in the universe you will find the same principles of matter, life and mind and so on. The whole ascending scale of evolution will be common everywhere. The life forms may have differences, just as even on earth, between races we have distinctions. Skin color, head shape, ear form, nose shape, lips, certain variations exist. And we are quite rich in variation, if you consider that way. And why not that other planets have their own variations? But the principle of a body and a life energy and a mind and so on, and the difficulties of nature would be common. 
And so it does not change the nature of the yoga, but it changes our perspective of our sense of self-importance. In reviewing our place, we also recognize that there is something distinct here which others may have experienced but not in the same way. And I'm going to touch upon two facets. One is the diversity of human types, which may not be so common in other species or other beings of other planets. And the other is the distinction that the psychic being as a prominent principle in evolution brings. First, Sri Aurobindo has a reference when he speaks of evolution. He speaks of two kinds of evolution, an individual evolution and a species evolution. He says that it's possible to have a species evolution where there may not be, for example, a reincarnation of individuals, but just the species itself continuing. In that case, he says, there will be a certain kind of uniformity and part of the species dying out, another part developing and so on, and leading to a very graded, slow process of evolution, where the collective identity would be stronger than the individual. We see this, for example, in ants, in bees. We also see it in larger animals where, which live in herds. So you have, when if you observe sheep, they tend to follow each other, they tend to take to they tend to stay together. If one drifts off for too long, it tends to come back because the group consciousness is still strong enough to pull back. And then he says separately there can be an individual evolution which may continue across lives. And in the case of the human beings, both are on at the same time. But one may predominate the other. So we have also our herd instinct. We have also our collective evolution of a species, of a community, even of a linguistic uh, subculture and so on. All these things continue. Within that we have the complexity that an individual evolution brings. And so it is possible, for example, that an individual is born within a community and stands out as being completely different. Because he is not just a product of the genes, but he also carries his own individual line of journey. This would not happen in a species where the individualization is not so strong and the psychic being is not so developed. You will recall also a comment of the mother. Not so cryptic, she was very explicit. She spoke of how the Chinese as a people originated from the moon. And she says, when the moon became too cold for life, they migrated to the earth. And she made the comment that at that time at least, the psychic being, the individuality of the psychic being was not developed among the Chinese people. Subsequently she said, after the war things have changed, there's a huge mixture, now I don't know how things are. But we can see here a possibility for an entire collectivity, a race, a species even, to have not, to not have a formed individualized psychic being and yet evolve as a collective. And all of these point to a huge range of possibilities in the way evolution works. I came across something very interesting in a book written by an Australian mystic. It was his experience that among all the species on the earth, dolphins had a special distinction. He found that among dolphins, it was possible for one individual soul to share two or three bodies. And one dolphin body to inhabit several such souls. Now in the field of human experience, also such things do happen, but they are more rare because the individualized psychic being is a much stronger, but still something along these lines to some degree does happen. And Sri Aurobindo refers to that possibility and he says the whole business of uh, migration of souls is not as simplistic as people think. It's not like 
oh, this personality hops on into next body and so on. He says there are actually things which can happen where something of your personality may branch out and merge in someone else's personality. Or the soul in the interim between two lives on earth may remain in, uh, outside the body and align itself with another evolving being and share in its growth or share some of its capacity with the other and so on. So he says there's a whole range of complex possibilities. And it includes this possibility of a body being shared. And there could be species of this kind, developed conscious intellectual beings and perhaps even spiritual beings who share in this way. Living on other planets perhaps. Maybe even on the earth there might be some remote tribes we do not know of where this kind of thing might happen. Because after all, on earth, all these possibilities are somehow represented. The second interesting difficulty that emerges from this distinction is having individualized psychic beings, the individuality gets more strongly emphasized. Especially as that possibility must be developed in a special way. And so at an early stage, before the psychic being can assert itself, the individuality, individuality reflects in a strengthening of the ego sense. Individually, we are stronger in conflict with others and there will be a tendency for a heightening of conflicts and divisions until that inner presence comes forward and begins to lead. And so on earth, it could be even understandable that we have more conflicts than there might be on other planets or other species where there is greater uniformity or even a sharing of consciousness. And I am saying all this because it's time we begin to widen our perspective and perhaps even prepare ourselves for the eventual possibility that we engage with beings from other worlds, other planets and find our right place in the overall universal evolution. So when we think of evolution when we think of the whole process of yoga, it will be helpful for us, even for our understanding and more true also, to recognize that we are part of a massive, universal process of awakening of consciousness. And not just this little ball that we call the earth. It's happening everywhere. And we are part of something which is enormous. The whole universe itself, if we see from this perspective, is one being that is evolving. Consider the whole mass of matter in the universe is one continuity of substance. The same type, the same elements, the same atomic structures everywhere. It is one continuity of universal life force, which is even flowing in what we call empty space, across planets, across solar systems, across galaxies. One continuity of a universal mind, of which our mind is a, like a little island, fragment, small projections. And so if you looked at the whole universe in totality, you have a physical body, you have a life energy body, and you have a mind body. You could call the entirety of the universe as one being, conscious, with a universal mind, universal life force, universal body, of which we are like cells. Or perhaps you can see our galaxy is like a cell of which our solar system is like a sub-cell and our planet is like a smaller cell of which we individual human beings are like a still smaller unit. And the whole journey is of this universal being. It is something towards this uh, kind of a vision that uh, many of the mystic texts point to in the Veda we have this Purusha Sukta which is a description of the body the being, uh, the body of God and it is described in as having four parts and so on so you can see it on a symbolic level but you can also see it at a practical material cosmic level that the whole universe is one person, one being who is evolving One of the difficult transitions we are having to make 
is to overcome our internal divisions of national identities. And to a large extent it is not because of people. It used to be so, and the supramental consciousness has brought things together in ways we couldn't have imagined. But to a large extent it is because of fear, and especially fear from the military interests. Fear of sharing of resources, fear of somebody else overwhelming, taking over what you have and so on. If you look at international politics, it is only based on fear. There's nothing else. And it has all to do with resource sharing, oil and things like that. There's no other reason for us not to come together. And so, we are at a point where a nudge from outside might be helpful. In, at the end of the Cold War, 1988 I believe, Reagan was in Russia and in a public meeting he commented how easy world peace would be if there was an attack from outside the earth. <laughs> the easiest way to bring people together is to have a common enemy. Of course, it doesn't really solve problems. Once the common enemy goes away, we start fighting again. But, but it was a kind of thinking which was a little novel at that point, but which may perhaps change, and not so much because of an attack from outside, but simply the recognition that there's life outside waiting to greet us if and when we overcome our own internal differences. So this is as far as I'm willing to go uh, without uh, putting myself out on a limb. I would leave it to you if you are further interested in this line of thinking and the implications that it means for our present and future. So this is as far as I wanted to, I felt comfortable sharing to begin with. I thought the rest of the time, since we have barely about half an hour, we could take any questions you have or continue from the questions which were pending the last two or three sessions. Yes. Okay, we'll keep that for later. Hmm. There was a movie about this, like, yes. you know, attempt from outside yes. all of the world. Very famous mm -hmm. There are many such movies now of, uh, yes, of interactions with beings from outside. Generally, they tend to be scary movies because that sells better. But to think about it this way, if those beings with that kind of technology had, uh, were not friendly, well, they would have done what they wanted to do long ago. So we have to start with the assumption that we are surrounded by friendly beings. Mm -hmm. Yes. I've got two questions. One, uh, the first one, is uh, if these higher evolved people, or at least their technology, could uh, uh, to disassemble weapons, couldn't they also stop nuclear bombs? Yes. And the second one is about the type of beings having to evolve uh, and take birth on Earth. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the second question is about typal beings. Yes. So the second question is about typal beings having to take birth on Earth. And I'll deal with that first before moving to the first question. And that has to do with other worlds, levels of consciousness. Each level of consciousness has its own experience of worlds. Worlds of the vital being, vital consciousness, mental consciousness, and many domains within them. There's a whole infinity of universes within the universe. But the observation Sri Aurobindo makes is evolution involving an unfolding of a new possibility which was not there, inherent, is only possible in matter. Because all these levels of consciousness as if enter into complete inconscience to become matter. And so out of matter they can emerge and you have the experience of evolution. But on other planes where all these levels of consciousness are not so buried, hidden, you do not have the same kind of unfolding experience and therefore one cannot call it evolution, but they have their own experiences of growth and development of their own possibilities. A vital being can become stronger, more skillful, more intelligent and so on. You could call that evolution, but not evolution in this sense of something unfolding which was not present before. So the way it is described is beings of the higher worlds, including more spiritually evolved beings of the higher worlds, the, the gods, have to take birth on earth if they want to evolve further. 
Now generally the highest of these beings, the highest of the gods, even there are gradations among them in consciousness, the highest of them don't like to do that. At best they put out an emanation to assist in the human evolution, but in the process also they nourish themselves with a new dimension of human experience and so on. And we have many such examples in human history. But uh, they generally don't like to incarnate because it involves entering the human consciousness involves loss of their divinity. That sense of self-forgetfulness and the struggle and the mixtures and the muddiness that is associated with this uh, uh, material substance. And so the mother observes that they have promised, the highest beings have promised, she names in particular beings like Shiva, have promised to participate in earth life once the human body is transformed into a divine body and they will not have to lose their, themselves into that struggle with ignorance and then they would incarnate in material form and participate in the human play. But that is something still far. Until then we have to do with their emanations. That's as far as your second question goes. Your first question was about these beings from other worlds, planets, if they can intervene in this way, can they not destroy our nuclear weapons or neutralize them? As I pointed out, they did do that on a few such cases. It has happened more than once. Uh, but the point is, the moment you do that once, human beings go into fear and will take countermeasures against them. And so it will just start off a different battle. A message was sent and that was all. But perhaps they are still there somewhere waiting in case we ever get into that kind of nuclear conflagration. They might still intervene if it is absolutely necessary. But the general principle in the universality of consciousness, especially with more evolved beings, is non-interference. And it's similar to what we do with less evolved beings. We do not like to interfere in the natural unfolding of wildlife. If a tiger is about to eat a deer, we don't say, oh, stop, that's not nice, that's cruelty. That's how the, for them, that's the normal thing. And the same principle applies when you look across planets. If there is an evolving species, we don't normally interfere unless there is some severe threat to them, to their survival or to the planet. And some things like that exists even within the universal uh, context. Okay, yes, yes. And yes. Of course, it's a very broad topic yes. if you just say yes. science and spirituality. But um, I'll touch upon two interesting uh, perspectives on this. One is that current science began in the context of Europe's revolt against religion and the rational age emerging into Europe in a revolt against religion, and therefore it dismissed everything associated with religion, including subtler realities. It became materialist because of the revolt and it fears expanding its scope to something beyond matter even when it finds itself face to face with those realities. Science in India did not undergo this kind of conflict. And so within the Indian context the scientific texts include realities of the life energy, mind and so on and of spirit. And they even consider that their understanding of matter is incomplete unless they can trace it back all the way to the essential unity of consciousness out of which this multiplicity emerges. But the moment you go into that kind of depth, modern science, which is materialistic and denying of higher things, will say, oh, that is metaphysics, that is not science. But that science actually describes and develops technologies based on this deeper understanding with physical implications and they developed machines built on these technologies. <coughs> so I have personally studied in great depth a text which is called the Vimana Shastra. It is the Shastra which is a manual um, science or manual of Vimanas and Vimana is a flying, flying machine, aeroplane. And uh, the text itself is so detailed it discusses everything from the clothing required of a pilot, 
the food required of a pilot, the kind of a machinery which he should be able to control, the completeness of a flying machine having so many devices to control its flying, and then machines within the Vimana by which it can locate other flying devices, by which it can see what is underground, by which it can fly in the air, by which it can fly in outer space. It describes various kinds of radiations in outer space which are harmful to human beings and how to neutralize them. Now this kind of uh, knowledge is there written in Sanskrit. The first time that we have it written in physical uh, substance is 1921, before that it was transmitted orally. But even 1921, the kind of descriptions you have are well ahead of the current aeronautics of that period. It just, it does show that there was something very advanced then. And there are other books which are, which where there's no problem of dating. One of them is dated to 7th century AD, uh, written by King Bhoja, which is called the Samarangana Sutra Dhara, which is the collection of sutras relating to warfare. And there are multiple chapters on different aspects of warfare, some which have to do with uh, building your own uh, defense structures, uh, warfare with horses, elephants and uh, diplomacy. And there's one chapter which has to do with machines. And among them there are four verses, okay, among the machines there are all kinds of machines. There's one which is called the elephant machine, is a metal device with wheels inside which the warriors sit and through holes they shoot arrows at the enemy. Now this is the equivalent of a modern tank. But similar con machines of similar construction, were, well they existed at that time obviously. And then there, is a, there are four verses which describe flying machines, the Vimana. And in those four verses they describe how a Vimana flies. And the description goes something like this. There are four cylinders containing mercury and these cylinders are heated from below by a rotating flame. And as a result, the mercury is made to release its latent power, which makes the Vimana fly in the air. And if that fire is taken to the upper part of the, play, uh, of the Vimana, then it develops, uh, a, it flies off with the roar of a lion and becomes a pearl in the sky. Well, there's four verses, that's all it says. Now this is obviously not the product of imagination only because these are texts which were applied, they were meant to be practically used. And they point to the fact that we had these uh, interesting technologies in the past. So this is to make a distinction between the traditional science of India and the current modern science. But there's another big difference which Yorbindo points to, that in the past the yogis had access to these subtler ranges and so many things they would do by using the subtler energies rather than physical energies because it was easier to do it that way. Current science, because it is materialistic, must find those same energies embedded inside <coughs> matter. For example, nuclear power. You have to go all the way down to the subatomic level to be able to tap into nuclear power, whereas the essence of nuclear power is still prana shakti applied in a particular way, which could have been tapped by different means in the past to produce similar results. And that's why we have descriptions in the Mahabharat, the Brahmastra and other weapons, where the uh, explosive release of energy was described as 10,000 suns, not 10,000, at least uh, many suns, and the result was people found their skin becoming black, their nails falling off, their hair falling off, which are all signs of uh, radiation poisoning. Obviously these are not coming from some imagination, but they were not nuclear weapons as we have them today, which are entirely material. They tapped them through mantras to access energies of a different order using a material vehicle which could have been very simple. But modern science in this way has gone very deep into matter itself as never before. And that serves its own purpose in the larger uh, scheme of uh, human exploration. So this, these are two important distinctions between, uh, let's say, ancient science and modern science. But the common feature of spirituality and science is the quest for reality. Science is looking for an ultimate reality. Spirituality, spiritual 
pursuit is also looking for an ultimate reality. The starting points are different. Science starts with the outer senses. The spiritual quest starts with the subjective inner uh, senses. But eventually they attain to a common perception of the ultimate reality. Modern science has gone so far as to say all matter is energy with the E equals MC square. The spiritual science went deeper. It said all matter is energy. It is all Chit Shakti. But it went further and it said energy itself is an expression of consciousness. Chit Shakti, not only Shakti. And there is a layer of consciousness beyond the energy which wields the energy which becomes matter. And it is possible for us not only to identify with that essential energy, but to identify with the consciousness behind and wield the energy by conscious choice and change the laws of matter. That's the direction in which the yogic pursuit goes. Whereas science has only stopped there and looks beyond and is afraid to go further. Current science. But that will change. Sri Aurobindo in Savitri uh, describes the vision of science. The first vision is where it, the world, universe is like clockwork machine. And it's all, it's all wonderful and fine. It seems to be a perfect description until it goes below the atom and then everything breaks down into a wave particle dance. And then he says there's a second movement of science which now sees everything in terms of wave particles and subatomic realities and energies. And it says even that must give way to a third vision of science which will be the true vision. So we are on the brink of something like that. It's just for the general population, science is easy to understand yes. and the spiritual yes, science. Yes. Oh, then we can put another perspective. Outer science, what it does is it observes nature takes some of nature's processes, intensifies them and uses them in a special way to improve human life. Okay, that's what science does and technology. And Sri Aurobindo says yoga has exactly the same thing. It observes nature, takes some of nature's special powers, intensifies them and applies them internally to change our internal states of consciousness. So what Science does externally, yoga does internally, but the processes and the methods of both are very similar. <laughs> so there's a perfect parity between the two. Yes. Can you give me the reference of Savitri where you said? Reference of Savitri, Narad will tell you. Where you said the vision of. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes. So there's a book you might be familiar with called From Science to God written by a physicist from Cambridge University. He was a student of Stephen Hawkins. He started off in physics and then after the first year he didn't feel like he was getting the answer he was looking for. It. <coughs> so he quit school and went to India. He spent a year or two in India and then he came back and he did a double major of physics and psychology. So in this book he is all these quotations, he's trying to show how science leads to spirituality. Mm -hmm. And he has a lot of quotes from the Rig Veda and he goes to different chapters. Yes. So it goes from the essence of quantum mm -hmm. physics mm -hmm. to you know, the, the yes. concept of light as physicists see it and on and on. So yes. there are mm -hmm. more and more people I think that are trying to yes. reach that yes. but through an intellectual uh, mm -hmm. mindset. Mm -hmm. right. On the human species and evolution, if we are talking about uh, what we are evolving and the Vedas and the ancient times, when the species were already developed at a certain level, why it was destroyed and we have to start again? Okay, it's an important question. We see when we look back, and especially those of us who see beyond the modern narration of history, which is very shallow and uh, superficial. When we look at our more ancient uh, records, we see high peaks of culture, civilization, and then suddenly a, maybe even a spiritual development, and then a kind of a collapse, a breakdown, and a rebuilding again. Why is that necessary? That's the question. When we uh, understand the cycle of human development, Sri takes pains to explain these steps. He says that at each step, something is reached but it must be integrated with all the previous steps. So when mind emerges, 
it must turn back upon life and upon the body and reintegrate those with this new consciousness and raise them and recast them in its terms. So the human life with an intellectual consciousness is looking upon our life and recasting the life itself but recasting also our values of the way we deal with our body, with our emotions in terms of rationality. That's the difference between the civilized and uncivilized man, right? If after the intellect we move to a higher level of the intuition, intuition similarly will recast the way the mind works, the way our life energies work and our body and all our values, whole life will be recast. But if somewhere along the way a step is skipped, something is missing, it needs a fallback to correct, to recover and then to move on. There's a very cryptic comment here Sri Aurobindo makes uh, right at the beginning I think in the either Life Divine or Synthesis of Yoga he says the fact that the human species has recovered the power of the intellect so quickly indicates that it was developed before and it was briefly lost because of, for some reason of evolution it had to go back and then recover. Even uh, he's, we speak of the Vedic period as an intuitive age an age where intuition had come to the fore but the power of rationality had not been sufficiently integrated and therefore there is a fallback a recovery, a completing, a tighter integration of rationality and then through that rising again into intuition. The question is are we now ready to make the leap beyond intuition to the next level which would be supermind or are we going to fall back because of something missing? And Sri Aurobindo's assertion and the mother's assertion is that we are on that point of readiness where we can move forward. So the way he explains it is that uh, each Satya Yuga, age, golden age as we call it, is different from the previous one and superior. Although there is a cycle of four steps, the cycle itself is a spiral. So the previous yuga, Satya Yuga and the coming Satya Yuga are distinct in this sense that the previous Satya Yuga had the experience of the Divine Consciousness in life but through symbols, through an intermediary. Whereas the present Satya Yuga of which we are on the brink is an age when we will experience the Divine Consciousness directly, one on one, from heart directly. And that's why we have the same idea formulated in different words, in different traditions. In the Christian tradition they speak of the second coming which takes place in the hearts of men. And that means the awakening of the Divine Consciousness in the heart where we directly relate to the Divine and we do not need any more the symbols. So this is a very important question, why, it's, why at all in the Indian tradition there is this idea of going into moksha or into nirvana and bypassing or ignoring evolution completely. Sri Aurobindo traces it back to a flaw, a limitation of the Vedic experience. You see in the Vedic experience they had the experience of the supramental consciousness even if on an individual level but the body was seen only as a vehicle supporting this higher spiritual experience but not itself participating in it. Matter itself was not yet seen in the possibility of divinization. Matter was seen only as a supporting base. So the symbol we have is of the candle flame and the wick. The wick supports the flame but it gets consumed in the process. The flame cannot exist without the wick. But the wick itself can never become the flame. So this kind of a subtle division still existed in that experience. The experience had not completely taken up the possibility of the body transformation. And this tiny flaw led inevitably to this final result that 
Well, if finally the body is not going to be divinized, what happens to it? It can only remain as a burden. A support, but eventually even the support becomes a burden. And what you find is the realization in uh, Buddhism which said you have to get rid of this domain of suffering. Realize the absolute to be free of the suffering. As long as you're in the relative, you can't be free of the suffering. Shankara comes after that like a correction where he says, well, the domain of suffering itself is a domain of illusion. So get out of the illusion. But in both cases, there is a getting out. There is not yet the concept of transformation. But in the rejection of material life in these two was so powerful that although there were a series of corrective events, corrective revelations, they were never enough to overcome the power of the uh, illusoriness of the world, of those experiences. And they are valid experiences. So you find immediately after Shankara, there is Madhvacharya, who brings back the Vedic ideal, who says that all this is Brahman, this world also is part of the divine consciousness and so on. But they don't have the same power. You find at the last stage, because there was the ascetic phase had begun by that time, and the ascetic phase has the effect of drying up the heart. So there is, a, in the last 500 years, a series of saints who bring back the heart, the emotion, the bhakti for the divine and emphasize that as if a corrective balance. And then finally there is the readiness to bring it all together with the ideal of including the body. And that's the work that Sri Aurobindo does. So if you see the sequence, there is a whole uh, logic to it. And there is an unfolding. But at that time during the Vedic period, that was all that could be done. Humanity was not ready for more. But through all this passage, it has as if prepared itself and is ready now for a change in the whole approach to the spiritual pursuit. It's not to say that the experiences of the Buddha or Shankara were uh, wrong. They were experiences, they are valid experiences, you can have them even today. But they are not complete. In the very idea that the world is a domain of suffering to be abandoned, um, you have an internal conflict because they speak also at the same time of the Absolute having a nature and a divine nature. They don't use the word divine, they speak of the Dharmakaya, which is the which is the equivalent of the Satchidhananda concept. And even in the illusoriness of the world, the question can be asked, where does the illusion come from? Who creates the illusion? And there's a whole chain of logic which follows from that. So you see an insufficiency in those experiences. They are valid, but they are insufficient. Eventually one has to face the fact that the world exists, is a manifestation of the divine, and therefore is intended to be a domain of divine revelation and transformation. Karma is a principle of action and reaction. <coughs> Anything you do has its ripple effect and it's valid. Whatever may be the belief that one may have, it's a valid thing. What is different is the emphasis one gives to it. You see, in the Buddhist and Shankarite <coughs> perspective, because the whole goal was to disengage from the world, karma was seen as one of the major chains binding us. And there is even in certain lineages, the idea of karma itself becoming almost mathematical. Like you have to balance out every tiny bit with another tiny bit and a whole complex network of dependencies. And Sri Aurobindo says, well, it's not like that because the psychological domain is not like the physical domain. It's not so mathematical. And very often, if you think of karma purely in terms of energies, the whole thing becomes very simple. I get upset with somebody and I throw out an energy of anger or hatred, whatever it is. That energy being mine, when it hits somebody, it provokes in them a reaction of anger or hatred. But being my energy, it tends to associate that feeling with me. And it makes them behave with a similar response towards me. right? Or the energy itself having gone out, having worked itself out and being exhausted, because it is my consciousness, it comes back to me to regenerate and draw from me again. 
and I find the same anger, hatred which I threw out coming back into my consciousness and I get embedded in it. Both ways you can see how what you put out returns to you. Think of it another way as a surface of a pond. I put a drop, I drop a stone, there's a ripple effect. Where does the ripple go? Finally it bounces somewhere and returns on me. Meanwhile it does its work but it comes back to me eventually. So the whole idea of karma is this. What you create, what energy you put out eventually because everything moves in the universe in great circles comes back to you. But there are caveats. There are corrections to this. If in the process I have changed my consciousness, the energy that I threw out at a lower level of consciousness, when it comes back, it does not get a hold on me anymore because I have changed. If I am the same person, it gets a hook into me and I get the same energy. But here, when it comes back, I have changed and it doesn't find anything and it dissipates. It fades out on its own. So there is not a mathematical sum involved here. The energies can dissipate, can fade, can be neutralized by a positive energy, can be even reabsorbed and all these possibilities exist. And after all that, not only I can put out a positive energy to correct the negative, not only I can rise above, but there can be an intervention from above. The Divine Grace can intervene and modify the karma or use it in a very different way. What would have come to me as a ne negative karma is now used for a positive outcome. So in the general approach of spirituality in the integral yoga, we recognize the place of karma but not give it an obsessive importance. Tell us something more about the theory of Yes. Just before that, uh, there's an incident which comes to mind. Somebody's uh, was narrated to us by one of the sadhaks. Their family astrologer informed them that so and so was uh, going to die soon. Something, some date was given, and of course they informed the mother. And mother simply heard and nodded. Then after a sufficient number of time had passed and nothing happened to the person, they went back to the mother and said, Mother, just to let you know that uh, he is fine. She said, Yes, I know. I have erased his karma. I have erased his destiny, she says. Now this idea that the divine grace can intervene and change completely is a very important uh, principle. And it is possible because the Divine Grace does not act as a fragment. You see, we are all pieces working within a domain of pieces. So a piece will always find a larger piece in the infinity of the universe. And it can always get overwhelmed. But when the Divine Grace acts, it is not a piece, it is the totality of the oneness. When it acts, it acts as a whole. And there's nothing greater than that. And it can mold things from within because it is the very substance underlying everything. So it can just change from within and the whole problem is dissolved overnight. The knot is gone. The energy is dissolved or it is redirected into something completely different. An example comes to mind where uh, the mother was helping one of the businessmen devotees to set up a sugar factory in Pondicherry. Lalji Bhai, and uh, she worked with him quite closely to see how far nature would collaborate in her work. And initially when they set up the factory, they found the machines breaking down very often. So it was reported to the mother. And the mother studied the problem and she intervened and then after that all the machines worked fine. And then she explained that the sugar cane when it was being crushed it had an anger of being crushed and that energy of anger was accumulating and harming the machines. So mother said she created an occult formation by which the same energy released from the sugar cane was redirected now to protect the machinery. And an occult intervention of that kind is possible to redirect energies and reassemble them and it's, it's a technology in that sense. And it uh, worked fine after that, there had no problems. The factory continues to this day. Hmm. Yes, you asked about Shraddha. So Shraddha, for those who may not know, uh, is a 
traditional ritual which is performed once in the year to give peace to your ancestors. At least that's the way it is conveyed. You go and offer some things, offer water, do certain prayers for your ancestors, for their well-being, for them to have peace. And there are many stories which say things like so and so passed away many years ago but he is still uh, unhappy, he is still stuck halfway between worlds because these, uh, his his uh, uh, further generations have not done the shraddha for, to propitiate and to give him peace. So there are these ideas, so people do it almost as a compulsion of responsibility. But there is a truth to it which is not perhaps so fixed and the truth is that all that our physical body is made of is the outcome of the energies, efforts of our parents. Who have their bodies as an outcome of the energies and efforts of their parents and so on. So in a sense we carry in our body the energies, hopes, desires, uh, efforts, good and bad, of our ancestors and we rely on that to a great extent for all that we have. The good things they did remain in us and we should be grateful to them. And in a sense they continue to live in us. Their energies at least continue in us. So it's also an occasion for offering thanks, for offering gratitude. But if something of their consciousness is still embedded in that energy and they still draw nourishment from it, then we also in offering thanks offer them release. So this is broadly the idea behind it. Uh, there's a truth to it that, which we can validate with uh, genetics. When you make a very strong effort to develop certain capacities, they are transmitted to the next generation. I mentioned this, I think, uh, yesterday. And in the Ayurvedic system we are taught that what you do to your body now remains as an imprint in the body consciousness and energies and survives down seven generations. Similarly, what you have is the accumulation across seven generations. And the seventh number is probably more than just mystical, it seems to have a biological basis because modern science confirms also that uh, the body completely regenerates and replaces every cell and atom every seven years. So the seven number has, seems to have some meaning. Sri Aurobindo has a very interesting comment about when discussing uh, epilepsy. He says that because of a certain defect in the nerves, uh, there can be an attempt at possession that beings of the vital world may try to get a hook into you and the body's resistance instinctive to it is what we call the epileptic fits. And the cure he suggests, if you can prevent the symptoms of epilepsy for seven years, by then the body completely regenerates itself and completely closes those weaknesses. And after that you will not have a problem. But even if once the incident recurs, you start counting your seven years again from there. And this is very suggestive when you think about it. It means that the habits you inculcate, the habits that you have created, even one single experience, which has a strong imprint on the body consciousness, retains its imprint for seven years. Unless, of course, you intervene and are able to somehow neutralize it. So, this is just to give you a sense of uh, the idea of something continuing. In my own consciousness though, I have a natural revulsion to this sense of connection with ancestors. And I'm going to share the reason why. Because I feel that I do not wish to be bound to that lineage of the heredity because my attempt is to grow out of these limitations into something new. That's the instinct at least. And therefore I do not allow in my mind or my feelings any sense of connection to the past. I would rather view this body as given to me now from which to build something completely new and not remain bound to that stream. So from that perspective, if you have similar feelings or whatever form it may articulate itself in you, uh, it would be better not to identify with those streams of the past so much if you are in the path of the yoga. Sri Aurobindo observes there are three influences which form us. There is the heredity, there is the environmental influence in our formation 
and then there is the influence of what the soul brings. If your choice, okay, then he says between these three, if there's a conflict, finally he says the soul's imprint can override the other two. Now it means of course that the soul is conscious enough and asserts enough. But if our choice is to take a path of yoga of conscious self-evolution where we want to exceed our limitations, then it is best to lean most on this third principle of the soul's freedom. And whatever you have received in your heredity and environment, offer thanks and gratitude, but open yourself entirely and exclusively only to the divine force and to nothing else including past and heredity and so on. That is a superior approach if we are to make significant progress. Yes. This might be a dumb question. Uh, do then souls stay within a family or within a country mm -hmm. or within they do? Yes. The souls have a complete freedom of choice when they take birth. Generally what happens at the time of leaving the body, the soul accumulates all the life experience, it reviews everything in a sweep of the gaze, in a moment though. And then, automatically when you have absorbed all that, the consciousness turns to what's missing, what next, what's the need, what's the aspiration. And that turn defines the form and experience or need for the next life. And when it goes into rest, it is in preparation for that, absorbing this life, preparing for the next. And so when it wants to take birth, it looks for an environment most suited for that experience, especially if it's a more mature soul. In that case, if it finds by affinity, uh, the family has provided a supporting base and being born in the same family will be helpful, it may choose that. Or it may choose a completely different environment for the need that it has. And accordingly, it may take uh, even different culture, religion, race, etc. Rarely it switches gender, but it has the freedom to do that if it wants to. Oh. <laughs> okay, at the back first. At times it happens, uh, you know, a child is born, and in moments, you know, the child dies. Then the parents are not Yes. essence of that child's birth. Mother explained this in this way, child death, children dying within a few days of birth and often seeming quite healthy. Mother explained it in this way, she said, when the soul moves to take birth, it moves from a state which is very different, from where it sees as in a distance a point of light which attracts it. But there are mischievous beings close to the earth zone which may create false lights which distract or confuse it. And having taken birth, the soul may discover it is in the wrong place. And then it chooses to leave immediately. Or, the second variation, it finds the body defective or incapable for what it wants. And then it may leave. You had a question? I was wondering, do the souls ever travel together? Yes. It's a very interesting question. Do the, do the souls ever travel together? There is something which we may call like a family of souls because they emerge from a similar impulse to manifest or from a single impulse specific souls emerge or souls even from different impulses having similar affinities of purpose they tend to group, they tend to come together and they tend to have repeated relations but it's not a hard and fast rule because it's in the domain of freedom one does meet once in a while or sometimes more frequently people we have known before but the relations could be completely different you know um, when you meet somebody and you haven't seen that person maybe for ever yes. but you know everything about that person yes it happens and, it is, and then when you somehow get into that and you find out everything that means mm -hmm. what is that Perhaps there is an affinity of soul at some level or perhaps it may be an intuition. Uh, well, I cannot say exactly what it is in this case. Yes. And we'll just last one question, Priya.
Possible, it could also be the human response when something tragic happens that we draw the most we can in terms of our growth potential. It's also possible that the soul was some extraordinary being and the body could not contain that power and so it had to drop it. It could be any of these. Mm-hmm. So we can close with a short concentration, half a minute, quarter minute. 